Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see everyone uh, in a new setting this year. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 17th Annual Pershing Square Challenge. My name is Benjamin Isaac, uh, one of the adjunct professors of the course, along with Lauren Harmon and Evan Zell. Um, we have had the privilege of teaching these students this semester. And it's extremely exciting to have reached this. We'd like to thank the Hobburn Center for making this evening possible, the judges for their time, the students for a great semester, and in particular the finalists and the team at Pershing for their hard work during what has been an undeniably difficult last week. This is a special class, somewhat unique at Columbia, and maybe across most other business schools. An entire semester where, beyond just theory and the privilege of listening to great investors, students get to be in the nuts and bolts of actually developing and diligencing a thesis, making expert calls, modeling, finding errors in PowerPoints, and seeing what really conveys the thesis, iteration after iteration. You know, the glamorous stuff. <laughs> but that's the reality of much of this work, and it's incredibly rare for students to get a sense of what that is like over a whole semester. I know how special this course is because the last time I stood in front of a Pershing Square Finals crowd was in 2014, when I was a finalist along with my teammates then. Lauren and Evan also took, their, uh, also took ASA during their time at Columbia. This course has had an indelible impact on my career, and Evan and Lauren would say the same. My finals was the seventh finals. By the end of the evening, there will have been 17 Pershing Square challenges, and it's worth thinking for a moment about what that means. As of this year, roughly 1,000 students will have gone through the program and have taken a shot at pitching the bill and the rest of the judges. That's 1,000 students that have had the trajectory of their professional lives improved and skills enhanced with this unique course. Given how many have stayed in the industry, it's a meaningful cohort of the investment management world overall. Especially during this time of year, we should observe that Dayenu, that would have been enough. However, simultaneously, 1,000 students have been introduced to the practice of philanthropy and how their giving can help mend the world in ways big and small. I was a finalist a decade ago, and I know that had a huge influence on me as well as on my peers. Bill, your generosity and time has made it happen. So from all of us, thank you for building this institution that has had such a palpable in impact on this community and the world. Logistically, each team will have 10 minutes uh, to pitch, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. After the event, there will be a reception on the third floor. With that, we're excited to hear the final pitches. Thank you again. So uh, first, um, super excited to be here. I can't believe it's actually 17 years. That, that is uh, a bit frightening. Um, but uh, I have to say that uh, I feel like this program, this class, has uh, certainly exceeded our expectations. I remember the first year, uh, it wasn't much, nor were the students, interestingly. Uh, but I don't know if there's a direct correlation, but the quality of the students at Columbia um, you know, over time has dramatically uh, improved. And uh, if it's, perhaps it's the appeal of this class that drew the most talented students to Columbia, or maybe it's just uh, uh, the business school getting better and better. So um, this is actually a class on, I'm sorry, I'm moving this train, on, on both investing and on philanthropy. Uh, we don't talk about the philanthropy part much during the year. I thought this is sort of an easy moment to talk about philanthropy because a lot of people are thinking and rethinking their philanthropy, uh, even with respect to universities, uh, in a sort of interesting moment in time. So I thought um, we'll get plenty of time to talk about investing, but maybe just a little bit about philanthropy. So the prize here is $150,000, and the, the panel, our prize, uh, our judges, get to decide whether we award it all to the first prize, whether we give the first and a second prize, the first, second, third prize. We've done different things over the years um, so that we get to decide that. But what the winners get to decide is where they allocate the resources. And the way we thought we'd teach philanthropy was you get the money and you get to decide what to do with it. You can keep it all. Uh, you can give it all away. You can go half and half, which I think many become the tradition over time. Ah, Kyle, another judge. It's okay. On time. Uh, and I think this is actually a year that the panelists should think hard about their philanthropy. You know, the tradition here is that get the money and you allocate something to a Columbia University uh, charity uh, of your choice. Uh, some alumni are voting with their feet and not supporting uh, 
the, the university that they've supported over time. I think it's something you have to think about. Do you want to be supportive of the university, or do you want to direct resources to a particular cause at the university that you think is important? Or do you want to allocate your philanthropic resources elsewhere? Or do you want to say, hey, I'm really young, and I could use all the money for myself. <laughs> if I'm invested in myself now, over time I can be more philanthropic. You know, it's kind of the Warren Buffett thing. <laughs> Buffett actually didn't do much in the way of philanthropy until very late in his career, and his theory was, uh, I actually asked him this question, but uh, the theory was that the money would, con if he kept the resources, he'd have a lot more to give away, you know, with the power of compounding. And I, my question to him is, I said, Warren, have we reached a point where society's problems are compounding faster than your you compound the money? <laughs> you know, it's an interesting point. <laughs> and a year or two later, he made a big donation to the Gates Foundation. I, I don't know that I had anything to do with that, but. Doesn't stop me from taking a little bit of credit for it. <laughs> anyway, we should start. Um, really looking forward to the uh, learning from the students. Um, just want to introduce the judges. Uh, this is Kyle Kligerman. Kyle uh, just went to Princeton. Oh, they actually, I can ask the judges to introduce themselves. So, Kyle, please tell us a little bit about yourself. You got a mic right there. Yeah, let's see. Give us a little bit of your history uh, in. From school see if to, this is, okay. to running a hedge fund. How did you get there? I think students would be very interested in that. Yeah, absolutely. So I graduated from Princeton in 2001, just dating myself. Unlike a lot of you, I did not attend business school, just to give a sense of path. But I spent uh, a couple years just in terms of life experience on the minor league tennis circuit. So there's lots of ways you get life experience. I then uh, went to equity research. Uh, that was my first stop. Then spent two stops at two different investment funds, one called Entrust Capital. Uh, the second called Tacoma Capital, and then the last five and a half years have uh, been running my own firm focused on small and mid-cap securities and consumer industrials called 7-6. And, and you started with how much capital and how much you have now? <laughs> uh, started with less than 15 million and now have about one, 160. Great. Thanks for talking. This is Manning. Hi, folks. I'm Manning. Um, I was judging, I guess, last year, so good to re-meet maybe some folks. Um, I've been working at Pershing Square on the investment team for uh, almost three years now. So looking forward to the pitches today. So what did you do before? I guess before Pershing, I worked in private equity at Warburg Pincus doing industrials and business services buyouts, and before that started in investment banking at Centerview. Thank you. Centerview. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm actually a graduate of the business school. It's been 30 years. I'm from the class of 94. It feels like a long time. And I was a graduate of the predecessor of this uh, class in security analysis. And I've only ever known the buy side. I went straight from business school to work as a retail analyst at Tiger. And then, uh, and I've only ever known being a retail consumer and then later with the internet, a consumer tech analyst, and I'm excited to judge. I'm also a coach now for um, young graduates in the industry, and if you like to follow me on LinkedIn, I also now do content from a Gen X voice, so uh, follow me if you like. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me back. <coughs> Sixth year, so Julian McIntyre, I'm the founder of 221B Capital Partners. Uh, we're a long short equity fund uh, that focuses on technology, renewable energy, and industrial companies. Um, I started my career in banking at Morgan Stanley and then went to the buy side in 2005 working for Art Sandberg of Pequot and then uh, ran the short selling process for Chris Hahn of the Children's Fund. Uh, just launched my own fund uh, on the 1st of March. Okay. Uh, Anthony Massaro, uh, I've been at Pershing Square on the investment team with Bill and Manning. Uh, I've been at Pershing for about 11 years now. Uh, was previously at Apollo Management and private equity for a couple of years. And before that, I uh, spent two years in the investment banking division of Goldman Sachs. Uh, I graduated from Wharton undergrad in 2009. And Whitney Hi, um, Whitney Tilson, sole claim to fame is uh, College Buddies with Bill. Um, <laughs> we uh, met and spent a summer selling advertising and Let's Go Travel Guides in 1986, if I recall. Um, he was class of 88, I was class of 89. I followed him a couple years, uh, I was two years behind him at Harvard Business School, uh, also class of 94. 
and um, uh, I've worked in the nonprofit world quite a bit, helped start Teach for America, something called the Initiative for a Competitive Inner City, then made the very logical career transition to launching my own little hedge fund with a hundred thousand dollars out of my bedroom in 1999. Bill and his dad were two of my first investors um, and built up to a couple hundred million and uh, had a good run. Um, closed it six years ago and now I publish investment newsletters. And with that, we start. <laughs> Is Hi, Academy Seth. first? Is it alphabetical? Yes, alphabetical. Evan is going to be talking. He'll give you guys a two-minute warning and a one-minute warning. Okay. Evan, you want to start? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Aman, and I have Anurag and Bayang with me, and we are very excited to be pitching Academy Sports and Outdoors. We have a short recommendation on the stock with a 35% return and a 3.2x upside downside skew. Academy Sports and Outdoors is a Texas based retailer that focuses on outdoor goods and sporting goods. Our thesis is based on our analysis of more than 400 basis points compression in operating margins from current levels. For research, we actually traveled to Texas. To visit stores, we spoke to senior industry executives, and uh, we also spoke with folks who own the stock, as well as sell-side analysts to get a perspective and validate our thesis. On returns, we just want to highlight that we have an 18-month hold, implying a 21% IRR. Um, the stock was down 10% on last earnings after management changed its guidance again, uh, and has been down another 6% since the last time we submitted the deck. So let's look at the business. It is primarily based in Texas. It has about 40% stores still there. On the revenue, we want to highlight that more than 50% of revenue actually comes from hard lines, which tend to be extremely discretionary in nature and have longer purchase cycles. Now let's look at the history of the business before COVID hit the world and uh, you know the company was still private. Let's look at the operating margins on the top left. As you can see, the business was struggling to make single digit margins. Same story on same store sales comp. It had negative same store sales comp, and for the last eight quarters, it has delivered negative comps again. Let's look at the earnings of the business. As you can see, the business was making about 50 to $55 million in net income. Even if we look at FI19 earnings, that would still imply a more than 60 times PE on the current market cap. So did the business create any value? Well, KKR certainly doesn't think so because during their holding period of nine years, it's EV accreted by a mere 2%. So what are the bulls betting on and why do we think we have a differentiated view? Two things came out based on our conversations with some of the top shareholders of Academy. First, the stock is really cheap at nine times price to earnings. What could possibly go wrong? Secondly, there is potentially an opportunity for re-rating because if the market starts buying the store expansion story, we could get re-rated. We did our work, and our analysis shows two things. A, the stock is not, is not cheap. It's actually expensive on price to FCFF basis. And given the store expansion trajectory, we expect this to continue a weakening. Secondly, ASO is actually opening stores to make sure that they can maintain top line growth. The business fundamentally has weak comps. And the only way to mitigate that is by opening new stores. So now getting to the investment thesis. Uh, our short recommendation has three clear levers. <coughs> First is weakness in comp store sales, which will drive a margin deleverage. The second is promotional activities getting back to pre-COVID levels. And the third is poor economics of new stores as you expand out of Texas. So these three levers will add up to a more than 400 bips of margin compression over the next three years, uh, which is why in, in our FI26 estimates, we get to a 7.5% EBIT margins. Now the consensus thinks that EBIT margins will be fairly stable. And that is the difference and opportunity which we want to capture. Uh, this margin compression leads to a 43% lower EPS in our estimates versus consensus for FI26. And this is the biggest driver of the returns as well. So if you look at the three metrics, com sales growth, gross margin, and EBIT margins, on all these three important metrics, we are sharply divergent from the consensus, which is informed by our research and analysis. Uh, and unsurprisingly, the sell side thinks that this is a consensus buy, and that is where we differ. So let's get into the first thesis. Why do we think comps are going to be negative? Well, let's look at the outdoor segments to begin with, which is one of the key segments for this business. 
As you can see, over the last decade, there was a steady decline in total participation. This was led by total decline in number of participants as well as number of activities per participant. And, they, and you can see clearly the industry got a shot in the arm during COVID. However, it's, way, it's, it's back on its way down. And based on our conversations with industry executives, they expect softness over the next couple of years. So why is that happening? As you can look at the products that constitute outdoor goods, they tend to have longer life cycle and infrequent purchase uh, behavior. During COVID, there was a strong pull forward of demand, and we don't expect demand to come back at least for the next 12 to 18 months. How do we know we are right, and what gives us confidence? Well, we looked at this guidance on comps by outdoor-focused retailers for this year. And as you can see, uh, most of them have guided to near double-digit decline in comps. The second important segment for this business is sporting goods. As you can see on the chart on the left, ASO has been steadily bleeding market share over the last few quarters. So why is that happening? Well, we actually spoke with a few folks at Nike, which is the largest vendor for most of these retailers within sporting goods. And as you can see, Dix, as well as Hibbit, are clearly gaining share within Nike. And based on Nike's you know, renewed wholesale strategy, ASO is not a preferred vendor. Now we're into the second investment thesis point, which is focused on promotional uh, activities. As you can see on the left, we believe ASO was a huge COVID beneficiary, and that is reflected in the margins as well. Uh, gross margins shot up by more than 500 bips in just two years, which was caused primarily by promotional activity coming down and price markups going up uh, because of a supply-demand mismatch. From 21 to 23, uh, there was a slight pullback in margins uh, because of promotional activity getting back into play, but that was largely offset by some one-time benefits that the company enjoyed because of like uh, reducing freight rates. But going forward from 23 to 26, uh, as the demand wanes, as, exp uh, as uh, I explained earlier, uh, promotional activity will get back into play and intensify. And although uh, management has a few initiatives around uh, inventory management and warehousing, they will not be enough to offset the pressures from these promotions. And that's why we expect more than 100 bip compression over the next three years. One thing to notice here is that uh, we have given them benefit of these initiatives and gross margin is still higher than where they were in 2019. Uh, so now this is the evidence for the claim that we just made. Uh, when we visited stores, uh, this is what we saw and heard from the store directors as well, that promotional activity is getting back to those normalized levels, and they have to do this uh, to get the footfall in. The third thesis point is around uh, management's uh, guidance and new store economics being weaker than market expectations. Management initially guided to an $18 million first-year sales for new stores, which was then guided down to 12 to $16 million. However, based on our analysis and conversations with store directors, we saw that this figure was more like 11 million in the first year with a gradual ramp to 14 million by year five. We also noticed that the gross margins for new stores were lower than that of existing stores, primarily due to a higher level of promotional activity and lower private label benefits. All of this results in new store ROICs falling significantly short of management's target of 20%. How do we know this is right? For the past couple of years, ASO has been adding 10 to 15 new stores each year, which has coincided with a steady decline in ROIC for the entire organization from 21% to 14%. So what are the key catalysts behind our short recommendation? The first argument is around SSSG guidance. As Aman alluded to earlier, ASO has been setting very aggressive SSSG guidance compared to peers, which we don't think it will be able to achieve. This isn't something new. For the past eight quarters straight, ASO has been setting very aggressive targets, has been guiding down their targets, and eventually missing on their same-store sales target. The second point is around uh, ASO's overtly ambitious store expansion plan. For the, historically, ASO has averaged around nine new stores a year, which is in line with the industry average. However, going forward, they're looking to add 35 new stores each year, which we think is unattainable. So now getting to the returns. How do you make money on this idea? Uh, in our base case, we arrived at a minus 21% IRR, uh, which is driven primarily by the three thesis points that we spoke about and a slight multiple contraction. So most of the returns are idiosyncratic in nature. Uh, in our downside and upside case, we've taken a range of exit multiples that is, uh, that is driven by the historical valuation of the company. And we arrive at a very attractive skew of 3.2x. We also did a DCF analysis, and that is in line with the valuation figure. We also looked at some risks behind our short thesis as well as their corresponding mitigants, which we'd be happy to discuss in detail during the Q&A. So to close it out, ASO is an undifferentiated business that had its day in the sun during COVID, but is reverting to long-term underperformance. Weak comp store sales, gross margin compression, and poor new store economics are what's driving our short thesis, 
through which we expect a greater than 400 basis points compression in operating margins. Mm -hmm. This will result in 21% IRR in base case with a 3.2x upside downside skew. Thank you. Okay, judges, who would like to ask the first question? Thank you. That's a great presentation. Could you talk a little bit more about the management team? Um, if you could give us a sense of their longevity, you know, their insider transactions. Um, you know, they've, you said, eight, eight quarters of aggressive targets. Um, at what point does one of them leave or get kicked out by the board? Um, so if you could talk to the management in more detail. Thanks. Uh, sure. So maybe I can, I can start. Uh, Steve Lawrence is the current CEO. Uh, this company uh, hired Mr. Ken Hicks as the CEO in 2019 before the IPO. Uh, that's when KKR uh, got him in. And then he sort of uh, was the CEO till June last year. And now it's Mr. C. Lawrence. So the team is fairly senior. And the C CFO at the time, uh, Mr. Mullikin, has resigned because he was in contention to be the CEO after, uh, after Ken Hicks. And uh, so, you know, the management team is fairly new, like a new CEO and a new CFO. Uh, in terms of like their ownership, except for uh, Ken Hicks, which owns about uh, $100 million worth of shares, uh, everyone else is fairly uh, new with like very little skin in the game. Yeah. And the only thing we would like to uh, like point out more is that if you look at the transactions that have happened over the last uh, two years, a lot of them have been open market sales. Uh, they've not been very huge in, in size, but look at the prices that they've been sold at. They've all been below the current uh, market prices. And this is something that is definitely concerning to us. The fact that, A, they do not hold anything already, and they're selling. Um, um, great presentation. Um, I want to go back to the slide with uh, one of the core pieces of your thesis is that you're going to be continuing to see negative comps. You already had two years of negative comps. so. Um, if you could speak to the timeline for this to play out, um, as you probably know from looking at uh, retailers, they, uh, they have a very slow death. They can live with negative comps and the price will not, the market will not react to it. And then it's a very slow death and then all at once, like with Bed Bath & Beyond. So my concern is here that you, uh, you know, you have a thesis, when will it actually play out? Sure. So, uh, you know, we just want to highlight that the market seems to be buying into the management uh, guidance, and management is actually guiding to a very strong SSSG for uh, this year. But based on, at least for outdoor, which tends to be the biggest basket builder uh, for the company, like most, as compared to hard lines and soft lines for hard lines, you know, outdoor and sporting tends to be the basket builder, which results in cross-sell. And we are clearly seeing negative comps. Every time there is a surprise on SSSG, where the market is expecting something and, uh, you know, the company delivers something else, like the valuation takes a hit. So that is what we are expecting by Q3, Q4 this year, when the market plays catch up. And just to elaborate on the SSSG slide, sorry, this was on the previous point. So as you can see, you know, the stock is very sensitive to SSSG broadly for the industry. This has done really well because despite COVID highs, they've delivered steady SSSG, whereas something like a sportsman warehouse has been crushed because of negative SSSG. And uh, yeah, this was. Go back to the start. Yep. Go back to that. Yeah. 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 So this was the point on basket building. This is just the apparel and footwear segment. So as you can see for, you know, players that are focused on soft line, apparel and uh, uh, footwear is actually like a more recurring, almost staple uh, type of product. So that their comps are much better. But for the hardliners, they have to get footfall through hardline sales. And so for the same segments, they actually deliver po pretty poor performance. So that gives us confidence that soft line will be impacted. And on hardline, I think the industry is expecting weakness. Go ahead, no, no. Great, great presentation. Um, I guess digging more into the hard line versus soft lines mix. I think you said half the business is hard lines, but that leaves, I guess, the other half in apparel and footwear, um, which I think, you know, long-term trends are still quite supportive, maybe unlike the outdoor segments. 
Um, so I guess what's your growth forecast for the soft lines business? Is there a big margin difference actually between hard lines and soft lines? Do you think the business could be mix shifting, I guess, in a positive way over time? Um, yeah, it's me, Nike. Uh, so for soft lines, uh, like uh, as we had alluded to earlier, and we've done this, so we, we've spoken with like people at Nike, and what they had to say was that uh, they are going more towards their preferred uh, retailers, so like Dix and Hibbit, and it shows in numbers as well. So we believe that A, ASO is losing share in these soft lines, uh, in the soft lines vendors, so like Nike is obviously one of the largest ones. Uh, on the hard lines, uh, so hard lines are like lower margin than soft lines, so as you lose share in, and you lose share and you sort of like, you know, make your product mix worsen from soft lines to hard lines, there'll be a margin compression as well there. But this is what like gives us confidence on the soft lines. And um, just, to, just to add to that, um, um, it's primarily focused on hard lines, so it serves as a basket builder. So usually people go into ASO for the hard line and then go ahead and purchase some of that soft line. Hard line products also have longer purchase cycles. So um, the incentive to go ahead and purchase both hard line and soft line from ASO goes down. Uh, and people would just go to Dix or any of the other soft line focused vendors uh, for, for their products. Right. So to summarize, you know, you're absolutely right. Soft lines tend to have higher margin and they also have shorter purchase cycles, which is why we see Hibbert and Dick positioned better. Uh, you know, they obviously do soft line, but our negative view on soft lines specifically for ASO comes from the lack of ability to attract footfall because hard lines will be impacted and therefore they will have weakness in soft lines. Maybe you could speak to uh, kind of <clears throat> balance sheet, uh, just their financial wherewithal. What ultimately kills retailers is usually they run out of money. Right. Uh, you've talked about a very aggressive expansion plan. So how are they financing the growth? Uh, is there a risk that, you know, opening up a whole bunch of new stores, you know, will have the benefit of driving comps and the street responds to the positive, uh, you know, the mix of uh, all these new stores with faster growing uh, comps? But uh, yeah, two part question. Right. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, just talking about where where currently the the company is, like on a balance sheet basis, uh, it's around like one to one and a half x the net debt to EBITDA. Uh, so it's not stressed at the moment. But the reason behind that is that over the last three years they've generated a lot of cash flow and they've actually prepaid some debt. Uh, if you go back and uh, like see what the cash flow was in 2019, it was around 250 to 300 million dollars of FCF. Going forward, this is exactly the range that we expect because a they're opening a lot more stores. Uh, like you know, 30 to 35 stores annually. B, uh, we we expect the cash flow from operations to be impaired. So both of these will lead to a much lower FCF. Uh, and although the balance sheet is not stressed right now, uh, as your EBITDA declines and uh, uh, and as our FCF also declines, we think that uh, going ahead the net leverage reaches to two and a half x. That being said, we we don't see the company having to like raise a lot of debt to finance the the new store uh, openings because it is making a, it is making cash right now. So it's not totally impaired and we don't expect it to go to zero, but it will be like significantly stressed going ahead. And to answer your question on SSLG, so new stores are actually being opened outside Texas. Based on our conversations, Texas is their home market and as they open, if you want to show the competition. Yeah. So the other states around Texas are fairly, uh, you know, penetrated and they are actually going to have like a hard time getting sales ramp up. So which is also the reason why management has guided down on new store sales ramp. Earlier they used to say 18 million, then they've brought it down to like 12 to 13 million. We expect it to shake it out, shake out at like 11 million. So actually new store opening is not like good for SSSG just because they are at a lower productivity because the other states that they're going to are already heavily penetrated and this is a very mature industry. Uh, Kyle. Yeah, I just had great presentation again. Uh, well done. Uh, just going back to the free cash flow slide, just have one question there. Uh, it looks like if you go back to the year, if you go back to 2019, and you sort of think about kind of normal free cash flow here, especially let's say they go build these stores, they fail, and then you look at what the exit is, right? You've got this 8x multiple, what the sort of fair free cash flow is at that time. It looks like you have a pretty big delta between DNA and CapEx when you go back to 2019. So I'm just, you know, kind of curious. They fail, they cut CapEx. How do you think about normal free cash flow here, and does that support the stock? Uh, right. So, uh, uh, so what do you all think is that if they if they actually like fail on, on the new store economics and they like reduce their their capex spend? Right. So the three sixty of free cash flow isn't you know what you would call sort of normal, right? They're doing a lot of growth capex to build. Right. It looks like maybe DNA 
I don't know, are there, is there an acquisition that caused a bunch of Amort into the DNA line such that? Going on, Charlie. It's just, were they under-investing in the business back in 2019? Yeah. I'm just trying to, I, I'm curious how you're thinking about, if they don't grow store count, what free cash flow would look like here. Right. So just to like answer your question on uh, were they like under-investing, yes, like this is what we've like heard when we spoke with people at Dix and ASO as well, that they were under-investing and that's why like even right now if you look at their IT systems, they're like very poor, they don't have good IT systems, they cannot even do like pricing uh, common across stores and stuff, so they have been under-investing in the stores. Now the management has been talking about these turnaround initiatives, but we don't think that's enough to like an offset these margin pressures. <laughs> Going ahead, if they reduce their store opening, now why we think store opening will happen is that A, that's how the management is incentivized on absolute sales figures, right? So you, so if your SSSG is, is impaired uh, going forward, the only way to offset that is to like keep opening stores. And that's what the management is even guided to. So we think they will keep opening stores. If they pull, if, if they like pull back on that, then your SSSG is, is impaired and then your cash flow from operations also uh, declines. But I think that's the offsetting factor and and hence the FCF will not be like significantly higher if they don't open stores. I think we're out of time, is that right? Thank you. All right, thanks very much, excellent presentation. teammates Erica and Kareem, and today we'll be pitching Vail Resorts as a long with a three-year target price of $337, which is good for an IRR of 22%, including dividends. Vail owns and operates an irreplaceable network of 41 regional and destination ski resorts, including all four of the most visited destination resorts in North America. Vail's flagship product, driving a third of revenue, is the Epic Pass. These are only sold at the beginning of each ski season, and offer unlimited skiing across all of Bell's resorts. The pre-commitment from Epic Pass customers generates increased visitation, which is important because ski rental, ski school, dining, and lodging make up 50% of Bell's revenue. And the model overall results in impressive economics. The business day run rates about a 30% EBITDA margin and 65% unlevered free cash flow conversion. Bell has a history of compounding returns for shareholders. Between 2006 and 2018, the stock delivered a 17% IRR and a 6.8x multiple, while growing EBITDA 10% annually and re-rating from 10x to 20x. Most of this growth came through acquisitions. In 2006, Vail owned just five resorts, and by 2018, they had bought 14 more. Since the introduction of the Canadian Icon Pass in 2018, the stock has struggled. Despite Vail growing earnings 44% and expanding its network of resorts to 41 the stock is flat because the multiple is G-rated, and today you can buy Vail for 9.8 times forward EBITDA, which is below where it traded for most of the post-GFC period. We identified three key reasons why we think the market is concerned about Vail. The first has to do with the past business model itself. The second is a lack of future acquisition targets. And the third has to do with climate change. Our thesis addresses each of these concerns. First, we think that Vail's pricing power combined with operating leverage will cause earnings growth to re-accelerate, and we model 9% organic free cash flow growth over the next five years. Second, we think that manage, management are wise allocators of capital, and while we're excited about potential upside from future acquisitions, we think they will largely continue returning capital as they already have. And third, we think the weather this season was uniquely bad, but also that climate concerns are broadly overblown. As the market begins to realize this and buy into our first few thesis points, we think the multiple will re-rate to 11x, and these three combine to generate our 22% IRR. <clears throat> Thank you, Joey. We believe a combination of limited supply, value proposition to customers, and duopoly structure should enable midstream low-digit pricing power. In fact, we think Vail is better positioned than Altera, given two key factors. One is the balance sheet. Vail is at 2.4 times ZT EBITDA, whereas Altera is at 5 times, which makes any price cuts difficult to stomach, given their CapEx ambitions and the risk of a downgrade at 6 times. Two, while we think that the partnership model that Altera has makes it the scale to compete, it limits its price flexibility. 
as any changes in pricing have to be approved by partner resorts, which are paid based on a fixed fee or a revenue share fee. So in 2022, Vail took advantage of this by cutting the price of the Epic Pass by 20%, driving a 75% increase in unit volume. As you can see in the chart, Epic is now 27% cheaper than Icon, despite having a strong network and despite having been a parity in the past. On that note, with Epic, you get equal destinations and more ski days for a cheaper price. In fact, our survey indicates that 65% of respondents see more value in Epic than in Icon, and that there's a high willingness to pay for a consumer pass for customers migrate to the window ticket. This is great as it confirms that the consumer is affluent, given that lower income families account for 14% of total skiers today versus 25% a decade ago, which holds well for pricing. So in 2022, in order to improve revenue visibility, increase fast penetration, and gain market share, the company cut prices by 20%. The strategy worked. They added 1 million users to the pass, with 75% of visits now pre-committed, which mitigates the risk of a bad weather season. For example, in Q2 2024, despite snowfall being down 42%, even that actually grew 8% because of that pass strategy. So what does that mean for long-term organic growth? We think that Vail can compound free cash flow at 9% into 2028 based on 6% revenue CAGR and 4% OPEX CAGR. On the revenue side, the key driver is going to be the pass price, given the pass price differential today versus ICON. As for visitations, we're expecting 1.2% CAGR in visits by 2028, which is still below the 2023 peak. As for OPEX, the key line to look at is labor and benefits, as that accounts for almost 50% of their cost base. Given that they increased wages by 50%, 5-0, in 2022, we're expecting a 4% CAGR in that line into 2028 for an incremental EBITDA margin of 53% and a 9% free cash flow CAGR, X any cash deployment, which Erica will discuss. Thanks, Kareem. So our second thesis point is on Vail's strong capital allocation. While the street has been narrowly focused on M&A, we argue that shareholder returns are actually being overlooked. So we looked at Vail's historic M&A, and here are our takeaways. On the left-hand side there, you can actually see that transactions have been small historically, averaging around 200 million transaction value at 8x EBITDA. On the right-hand side there, we actually calculate that Vail has averaged around a 20% return on its growth investments. And just to walk through a quick case study, Vail acquired um, Peak Resorts in 2019, which added 17 new resorts to its portfolio. They had a one-time $15 million capex outlay, and this transaction added $60 million of EBITDA. So the street is really focused on European M&A as the primary source of return going forward. And while we also agree that the European market presents a significant opportunity for Vail, we argue that this is just one piece of the story. So our work suggests that there are some differences in the European M&A playbook. The first being that the Epic Pass value is not yet obvious to European skiers. You would have to do 10 days at Andromat Sadrun or Crans Montana, which are their two newest Swiss mountains, just to break even, versus at Vail, you break even by going for just three to four days. And the second being CapEx investments for these two trans Swiss transactions are higher and target EBITDAs won't be achieved for another five to seven years. And you put all this together along with the different market dynamics in Europe where ski resorts are actually owned and operated by different parties, we conclude that European M&A is just not as immediately accretive as US M&A was. However, the silver lining is we do believe that Vail will get to attractive economics in Europe and the multiples of two large publicly traded um, ski resort operators Star and Company del Alps would indicate so. So what else is out there for Vail besides European M&A? Well, Vail has the strongest balance sheet when compared to its other privately owned competitors, such as Altera, which sells the Icon Pass, Boyne, and Powder. And so this means that in its downside scenario where the industry is under pressure, we believe that Vail would outperform and could even go on the offensive to buy other U.S. independently owned ski resorts or possibly even one of these competitors. And just to drive home this thesis point, as you can see, acquisitions have historically consumed the bulk of Vail's cash. Even in fiscal years 2022 and 2023, where the European expansion plans really picked up, they actually returned $1.1 billion to shareholders in the form of dividends and buybacks. In our model, we are projecting out, as Kareem laid out, a 9% organic free cash flow taker. And this would allow Vail to continue to re um, return capital to its shareholders um, while leaving that excess cash, that purple, for opportunistic M&A. Again, this is all organic, so we don't assume that they take on any debt. This is really a great opportunity to own a free cash flow generative company where a creative M&A will provide additional upside. Thanks so much, Erica. Um, so as our last thesis point, based on conversations we've had, it seems like there's a significant cohort of investors 
that just won't touch Vail given that they think the business is literally a melting ice cube due to climate change. A little bit of digging into the climate research reveals that this is not the case. <clears throat> so the Earth has already warmed a little under one degree Celsius since 1970, and this has driven many small regional ski resorts without snowmaking out of business. For large operators like Vail, however, which have been able to invest in snowmaking, the effects of climate change thus far have been more than offset by the overall growth of the ski industry. Vail's Midwestern and Northeastern resor resorts, such as Mount Snow, have nearly 100% of terrain covered by snowmaking, which enables them to get back up and running after a negative weather event in under 24 hours. Snowmaking expenses are largely allocated to CapEx, because most of the cost is incurred up front in building out the infrastructure. Once snowmaking has been installed on a mountain, the only variable costs are labor, water, and power, none of which is material to the results of the overall business. Now, to figure out how climate change will affect the ski industry in the future, we talked to a number of experts and came away incrementally bullish. Our first takeaway was that the past model in snowmaking will easily offset increased weather volatility. One expert we talked to said that this year was unique and that all of Vail's regions were hit equally hard by weather volatility. He thought this was the most correlated impact likely for Vail given today's climate for the next 10 or 20 years. And despite that, as Kareem mentioned, Vail managed to grow EBITDA 8% year over year. Our second takeaway was that species and shortening will be fairly gradual. So most research around species and shortening anchors into whether the world can achieve the Paris Climate Accord goals, which we've laid out on the right here. But even in the most draconian scenarios, species are only projected to shorten between one and two months, which on a five to six month total season across 30 plus years results in less than 1% shrinkage per year. And just to quickly run you guys through our evaluation, we ran three different scenarios weighted by the probabilities that you can see on the slide. Our base case assumes an 11x EBITDA multiple, which is about a one-turn re-rate from here, and that gets us to a probability-weighted TSR of 71% or an IR of 18% by the end of fiscal year uh, 2027, which is July 2027. So thank you so much for your time, and we'll open it up for questions. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, great presentation. Um, so I had, my question was on the thesis around pricing power. Uh, so you don't often see a company that has, like, significant pricing power cut prices by 20%. It's usually a pretty big red flag. Um, and EBITDA only went up eight. Uh, to me, that doesn't seem like a great trade, particularly because, you know, traffic, consumer traffic goes up immensely when you cut prices like that, and the experience on the mountains worse, right? Because the runs are more crowded, uh, the lines are, are worse, uh, and they weren't really, they were kind of at parity with Icon before, so I don't understand why they cut price. Uh, if you could just kind of address that, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, so I think it's uh, two, two factors here. Um, the first being that they can, whereas Icon can't. So when they cut the prices by 20%, Icon's volumes were flat, and yet they still didn't cut the prices because they simply cannot. The second reason is that they wanted to increase pass penetration. So if you think about like a pass user versus a non-pass user, they have higher LTV, they spend more, they spend on dining, schooling, stuff like that. So you bring them in at a pass of $500, and the goal is to upsell them to a season pass of 1000 to 1200 over time. So as you think about the next four years, the volume piece of it um, is kind of exhaustive. Penetration is tapped out, it's maxed out. So we're gonna move from a volume story to a price story and an upsell story over time. And that's why they did it. And we just wanted to point your attention to, uh, these are actually all the different types of Epic passes that you can buy. So the flagship is the one at the top, the 982 one, but they've also got the, you know, the day pass offerings and there's like with or without blackout dates. So you know, that's what we refer to. Um, great presentation. Uh, I have a question in terms of uh, revenue drivers. I mean, your thesis is very heavily balance sheet driven. And uh, um, what about the actual town? The uh, what, what kind of capital investments does the town have to make to increase uh, visitors and really drive demand and stay competitive with the other towns nearby, Snowmass, Aspen? and the entire Colorado skiing um, community. Yeah. So I pulled up our uh, little CapEx history here because this is something that we thought about a lot. So as you can see, this is, of course, a capital intensive business. And the different things that they have to spend on are just like new and upgraded lifts. So that gets people up to the mountains faster. 
Um, there's also CapEx investments of like actually expanding the seeable terrain so people have more areas to explore. Um, and also, as you said, the restaurants. Um, so this is something that, as you can see, that they've continually invested in. The guidance that they've you know, given in the latest investor day was that the core CapEx of about 189 to 194 million, we round to about 200 million. And actually, using our model, we're modeling out even a bit more. Um, and that's split out 60 to 65% maintenance, so just to kind of keep the lights on and running. And then 35 to 40% more of the stuff like new lifts, restaurants, things like that to increase the peer um, experience. Yeah, just to add to that, specific to the town CapEx, most of their mountains are based in pretty developed areas. If you think about their user base, almost 35% of it go to top three mountains, which are quite established. There is a housing shortage problem, to your point, which is quite um, something to look into. And that's why they had to increase wages by 50%. But if you look at their wages today versus, let's say, Altera, um, it's almost 10% higher. And that's why we're pretty confident in our OPEX assumptions. Just on valuation, you're focused on an EBITDA multiple. Why is that the right way to think about this business? I mean, it seems like a pretty capital intensive business. Lifts wear out, you know, particularly with increased utilization. Um, you know, do you have confidence, you know, a lot of times management underestimates, you know, what they call growth capex maybe just necessary capex to maintain a competitive position of the business. Why why not earnings? Why aren't uh, an EBITDA minus a, a capex metric? And maybe you could show us what those numbers, you know, compare those different numbers. Yeah, um, I can take that one. Um, so yeah, we, we use EBITDA here just because, you know, the competitors are fairly levered um, and it's a very, you know, PE heavy um, industry. Um, I don't know, we mentioned it trades at kind of like a 7% uh, free cash flow yield, which is pretty attractive. We also ran a DCF, um, which you know, obviously takes <clears throat> CapEx and leverage into account um, and got to a you know, price pretty significantly above where it's trading today. Maybe walk us through your DCF for now. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, like um, taking into account the risk-free rate going up over the last um, couple weeks, um, stocks got a beta of about one, um, we get to a whack of about 9%, um, and then we assume a terminal free cash flow growth of 3.5%, um, which we think is fair for you know, a business with pretty significant pricing power. And what, is that, what valuation does that get? That gets you to about um, 300 bucks a share, which is like 60% upside to our current price. Um, I'm an uh, avid skier and have had the... Uh, Icon Pass for probably the last six or eight years. Um, had the Epic Pass for one year in between when I was uh, during COVID because I was doing twice as much skiing um, and wanted to be able to ski both mountains. So I have a fair amount of experience. Some observations. Um, the Epic Pass mountains aren't as good as the Icon Mountains. That's why Icon can charge more, and that's why Epic had to cut their prices. So, and it makes me um, wonder whether they have the pricing power you've modeled. Um, and secondly, skiing has just gotten it's eye-wateringly expensive across the board. Everything is. Um, and it makes me wonder whether Altera has any pricing power either. Um, you know, I think at best you're looking at cash cows, but as Bill pointed out, you know, there's just a lot of CapEx and, and trying to, um, with the price of um, sort of the employees, the type of employees that they're employing, you know, boosting that, I don't think, I mean, I think 50% sort of caught them up, but that's going to keep going up. So, um, I'm, I'm not sure I see the growth story here. So specific to pricing, I think um, two things. One, your key competitor has been quite disciplined when it comes to pricing. So Icon has been increasing by 4 to 5% a year. Um, I think, too, if you look at the price per visit of a past user, it's been actually dropping over time. I think we have it to almost $30 from 200 like a decade ago. Um, so if you use your pass to do see the value prop, you can pay the extra 5%. If you don't use it as often, then I think there is some risk on, on visitation. Yeah, maybe just to add, I think bringing this up again, I think that's why we saw them already, um, behind. Like, that's why they started to introduce like the day pass because, I mean, it is a pass product and you're still getting people to commit up front to actually going skiing. And so the idea is that even in like kind of a crappy weather scenario, like the season has pretty bit, been pretty bad in the West, honestly, I'm sure as you know, um, people are still committing to these types of products like up front. And so that in the future, once they're already kind of on these epic mountains, they'll be coming back. Yeah. 
And just to add to it, in terms of retention rates, it's actually improved from 59% to 65% over the past uh, 18 months. Or so. And then just, just one last thing. Um, so that's definitely a narrative on the stock. I think a contra narrative is, you know, there's too many people going to Vail Mountains and it hurts the ski experience. Like clearly there's a lot of people who want to be skiing, right? Um, and so you kind of can't have both, right? Like it can't be like there's too many people going, but then also they don't have pricing power, you know? Yes. By the way, my observation from when they did cut their price and got the million, it was an absolute catastrophe on the mountains. They just, they wrecked their brand name um, because there were huge lines. They didn't staff up properly, et cetera. Um, uh, so uh, I think that was a huge mistake they made. Last question, Kyle. Yeah, just curious, when, especially this time when we've had rates go up a fair amount and you have levered balance sheets, just curious what the cap structure looks like, how it's financed. You know, sometimes these companies are, if rates stay higher for longer, they could be over earnings. So just curious what that looks like. Yep. I, yeah, um, so they just refied um, a pretty good chunk of their capital structure at 6.5%. They're paying six and a quarter on that before. Uh, we're modeling 6.5% as their cost of debt going forward. Um, they're a junk credit, they're double B credit, um, but trade kind of tight. Um, relative to other double Bs. So it's, you know, a risk all these kind of companies face, for sure. Okay. That'd be great. Thank well you. done. Thank you for having us here. I'm Jennifer. This is my uh, colleagues Morgan and Yadon. Uh, yeah, I think so. Maybe I, I, I'll speak louder. Uh, today we are pitching short Pool Corp with a target price of $240, implying 33% of share price downside. Pool Corp is a short. It is trading at peak earning because investors believe it is a long term compounder, but we believe it is actually a fallen angel with intensified competition and limited growth runway. Our variant view shows that the company is going to miss its guidance in 2024 by 9% <coughs> and miss its guidance in 2025 by 17% because of three reasons. First, normalization <coughs> of COVID pull forward demand. Second, intensified competition. And third, limited growth potential. Before diving into our thesis, let me provide some background information. Pool is a specialty distributor that sells water supplies, such as chemicals and water pumps. Pool Corp used to be a share, uh, share market darling because it successfully rose up during the past two decades and comfortably dominated the market with over 40% market share and no real competitor. And it benefited from the COVID pull forward demand. And it's now trading at peak multiple because the market believed the Earnings decline in 2023 is going to reverse in 2024 and, and going forward. However, we believe the good days of Pool Corp are over. Uh, we believe our first thesis has to do with a 9% earning miss in 2024. During the COVID, the company benefited from, uh, from chemical shortage, uh, <laughs> equipment mix upgrade, and also surged new pool construction. And all of the three factors is going to flip and work against the company in 2024. Let me dive into the three revenue drivers. Chemical revenue is the foundation of this business. And chlorine-based chemical is 6% of the revenue and high single digits of the profit. Chlorine price dropped 30% from the peak. And we believe this drop will be reflected in company's rev uh, revenue in this pool season this summer. On top of that, PCCA is a chlorine-based chemical used in water sanitation, and the oversupply of PCCA will further bring pressure to company's revenue. Altogether, chemical revenue will translate into 2% of revenue drop in 2024.
The second revenue stream for the company is equipment, which is 40% of the revenue. We believe the equipment upside, uh, upgrade cycle has ended. According to the largest national retailer of pool supplies, Leslie's, the average selling price of equipment has already started to drop because of decreased purchasing power. So the market is looking forward for a like-for-like -like price hike. We believe the mixed headwind is, will, be more, will more than offset the price hike in 2024. Third, new pool construction and remodel is tied to 40% of the business. And according to our channel check of backlog and pre-order in the industry, new pool construction will down 15% this year, which will translate into 6% of revenue loss. Putting all the three factors together, we believe the EPS is going to miss guidance by 9%. And it, the company is going to cut the guidance again during the summer, like it did in 2023. From last year, the industry has been suffering from a down cycle, and Leslie's share price is down over 60%. However, the market is very forgiving of Pool Corp, because they believe it is a long-term compounder with a glorious history. But we believe the good run is over, and my colleague will dive into that. Our second thesis is about the intensified competition that is overlooked by the market. This will be translated to 5% drop in revenue and 2% drop in gross margin. Bookwork used to be a very successful roll-up story, and for the past two decades, they barely have any legitimate competitor. They have 40% market share right now, until 2021, when Heritage get into space and quickly claim 12% market share in only two years' time. Then, Home Depot announced that they are going to acquire Heritage in March this year. So we, we believe this will make the rising star even more powerful. Heritage has been growing not just at the cost of mom and pops, but bringing competition head to head with Pool Corp. They typically acquire or open a new store just pretty close to Pool Corp, and now the two companies largely overlap in locations. We spoke to over 20 industry experts, and price war, sales rep turnover, and customer churn are the words we frequently hear. So for price, typically Heritage matched the price with Pool Corp and offered 2% higher rebate. For sales rep, they offered 10% higher compensation and recruit directly from Pool Corp. For customers, some professionals already told us that they switch all of the volume to Heritage because of the higher rebate. We believe those changes are structural, but because Heritage was only established in 2021, a lot of the structural changes are just buried under the cyclical noise during the COVID. And now Home Depot is going to make things worse for Pool Corp. The essence of the, the specialty distributor is about volume. When you consolidate the volume, you're going to be moved to the higher rebate tier. And Home Depot already purchased the same product from the same manufacturers as Heritage. And when the volume doubles, this will move them to a 2% higher rebate tier, and they can be passed to customers without margin concerns. Now the math is simple. Heritage used to be at a disadvantage compared to Pool Corp regarding the rebate from manufacturers. They tend to pass all of their rebates to the customers compared to Pool Corp retain the majority of them. And after the deal, when Heritage is moved in a higher rebate tier and passing to customers, it's simply um, unsustainable for Pool Corp to have a 5% difference in rebates. And when they match, this will translate to 2% drop in gross margin. Pool Corp is trading like a high quality growth stock, but with the hope of revenue re-accelerating uh, re starting this year. But we believe they're a limited runway because they already captured 40% of the market share and the roll-up strategy will not work continue uh, uh, going forward. The only strategy left for management to grow is to expand their store uh, as they stated in their earning call. But we believe their 10 store opening goal is unrealistic based on their track record of over-promising and under-deliver. Looking at their history, excluding acquisition, they have never reached 10 new stores historically. Looking at their most recently opened new stores, they are all in the frost belt uh, state where only have four months of pool season. We believe those stores will never reach the same efficiency level of the ones in the sound belt state. And this further indicate that the market is saturated and Pool Corp has to open new stores in those less desirable states. Roll-up has been very successful for the past two decades, but 
this great track record is irrelevant to this new CEO, Peter, who just become CEO in 2019, who has less skin in the game. And management in the most recent earning call, Q1 2024, also admit that merger and acquisition will not contribute over 1% going forward to their top line growth. And former employee also mentioned that the new CEO bring culture change that forced a salesperson left. Combining with our short-term catalyst of, of deflationary headwind and long-term overhang of intensified competition, we believe this represents an asymmetric opportunity to short the stock at peak multiple with limited upside and with a large potential of fundamental deteriorating. And we assign a target price of 240 by end of this year, which imply a 33% downside. And we use 18 times multiple, which is also higher than their pre-COVID 10-year average of 14 times. If you're thinking about shorting this stock, now is the time and you are not alone. <laughs> so first group, there, there are three groups of people with you. First is management. They just sold $15 million worth of stock open market in February this year. And second group, a bunch of short sellers are starting to build up their positions. Third, we put our own money into this trade. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the presentation. We are open to questions. I just ask a quick question. Um, normally, when I was shorting things, I was looking for 50% earnings misses, not 9%. Um, any thoughts on that? We think we are being very, actually being very conservative. First, we use a higher multiple than pre-COVID level. Yeah, sorry. I'll move the mic up. Okay. Um, uh, I think we are being very conservative because first, on multiple, we are using a higher multiple than pre-COVID level. But actually, the business quality is just uh, less, uh, less desirable than pre-COVID because we have a new competitor, basically. And second, we actually only let it lose 1% of market share to Heritage, which we think is actually very conservative. And, and we actually uh, uh, applied a very conservative EPS uh, uh, estimation. Yeah, so basically we're thinking that narrative change can be slow for this company, so we're not being too conservative on multiple. And also, if you think about if the, uh, if the competition intensify, it's more, se more severe than we thought, then the 10% drop in volume, actually 60% of the company's cost is fixed cost, then that will be very dramatic uh, if you also consider operating leverage, free leverage. So we're being very conservative in our basic case scenario. Two questions. You know, one, what does their balance sheet look like, and what would an impact of a decline in their earnings have on their financial viability? Yeah, I could take this question. So they have currently have one billion uh, debt, and their debt over EBITDA multiples is around two and uh, two and a half. And they just paid their uh, three hundred million uh, Q one, and this debt is maturing twenty twenty six. They yes, they can refinance, but they have to like pay a much higher interest rate to refinance if interest rate keeps uh, what uh, is right now. Um, and yeah, and also that the company is actually very tight on cash. So currently, their balance sheet has seventy million of cash, and uh, their typical OCF is about four hundred million, and typically it's one hundred million of capex. So that will generate about three hundred million of free cash flow. However, they pay the majority of their OCF to shareholders uh, through repurchasing dividend, and that about two percent yield annually. However, we have already considered that in our downside, uh, downside scenario and, and in our downside. So uh, it's not going to be like a huge impact in our downside. What's, what's the risk? I mean, where could you be catastrophically wrong? So, for example, Home Depot bought their competitor. What is Lowe's response going to be? What if Lowe's decides to buy Pool Corp? <laughs> Yes, we think that could be a legit uh, downside to this business, and basically we have no access to those uh, measurements, so we cannot comment on that, but it's a, 
uh, 16 billion um, dollar company, so probably lots have to think about it. Is, is there still a runway? Because Full Crop already have 40,000 uh, centers versus Heritage only have 100. So like there's still a runway for Heritage, but Full Crop already got 40% market share. Where could you go from there? Like, <coughs> you go to 80%? So I, I guess uh, all the company will do the math. And also like the company is trading at peak multiple. Where is this going? Like, what do you want to grow? Where do you want to grow this business? So, oh, we, we literally have no access to the risk management, but yes. Yeah. And just to, uh, sorry, just add, add on to that, because Home Depot has been very serious about developing their pro business. So they've been uh, investing about $2 billion in the, five, five, in the past five years to try to build their like, flat bed distribution center. Those are capability to serve the pro. Also, if you think about like the uh, revenue mix, 50% of the revenue already come from pro. So they want to do more cross-selling because like those pros already have like contacts in, in, in Home Depot, but probably like only 10% of volume. So there's a lot of upside for them. However, for, for Lowe's, actually, they have a much lower mix from the pro, uh, from the professionals. So probably there's much less synergy if you think about things in this way. And also, like uh, if you look at um, one of the reasons why they want to do the business is that, uh, sorry, probably. Um, while you're flipping the yeah, you're slide, um, I can <laughs> add in one point that's, so, if um, Heritage can start it in 2021 and just quickly claim 12% market share, I think it shows that there's no barrier to entry in this market. So why not Lowe's just to start it to acquire small distribution centers and combine them together? In that way, that might be like, uh, they might pay less um, instead of like just buying out pool all right. Yeah, and here is basically what happened uh, to uh, Home Depot's plan, like funding market share in the pro business. So first they actually started from light pro and the MRO. And now because the uh, uh, complex pro is where they have only 4% market share. So that's it. this is like a step-to-step -step plan. But for Lowe's, they're like way behind and it doesn't make so much sense for them to start from distribution, uh, specialty distribu distributors. Yeah. Thanks. I just had a question on um, how do you think about the risk of uh, an acceleration in housing starts, particularly as like millennials and eventually Gen Z need homes, and also kind of in migration. A lot of these like warmer states, Texas, Florida, Nevada, others are seeing substantial in migration, I guess partially offset by California. Um, but how do you think about, you know, the risk of kind of supply going up and there being kind of a tailwind uh, from that? And then just a second unrelated question. Uh, I assume Heritage was bought as part of SRS, or is that not right? Yeah. Okay. And what percent of SRS was Heritage? Uh, it's uh, one six. A sixth, okay. So maybe not Home Depot's primary bet in acquiring heritage yeah. credit, right? Yeah, maybe to address your second question first. Yeah. So basically Home Depot is saying that I want to um, go category by category in a specialty distributor sector. So this is like the first the three sector they choose. And specialty distribution is like in 200 billion market time. And SRS is subject to 50 billion. Uh, so it is already a very large time. So we think that it actually makes a lot of sense for them to do this step by step, and they're already going to emphasize this on this market. And for the first one, Yamun, do you want to Yeah, that? so um, there's an uh, increasing uh, percentage of uh, pool calls, and so which shows that um, people have less and less interest in uh, uh, pools. And also, like, uh, during COVID, there's a huge pull forward demand, so you already so you only have one backyard and you only have one place to build your pool and it's that's the time that you can build your pool at zero per percent interest rate and if you don't add that time now is not the time to add there's a question on that chart is that net closings like is that yeah. op closings op like or is that yeah like it basically it means when you have no pool but you choose to close it down okay yeah thank you Great, great presentation. Could you uh, did you uh, draw up a map of the store rollouts of Heritage versus Pool that you can take us through to see what the adjacencies are going forward? Uh, basically, in our primary research, uh, we talk to a lot of uh, local salespeople, and they tell us Heritage basically opens door door to door with uh, with pool, uh, pool court and try to acquire the largest customers from pool court, like poke them like year by year. So it's very direct head-to-head -head competition. 
Yeah, and the reason behind that is because uh, swimming pools typically concentrate in some belt region, which is just for space. Mm -hmm. So the market is very concentrated, and the competition is more head to head, and also there's more overlap there. Yeah, and based on primary research, they are recruiting salespersons from Pool Corp and giving them 10% increase on uh, their base salary and also giving them monthly bonuses. And salespersons are also transferring, the, uh, bringing their own customer with them from Pool Corp to Heritage. Well, obviously, Heritage <coughs> offer higher rebates, it's more attractive. So, like one of the uh, contact told us that one salesperson in Texas just moved like 30 of his customer from Pool Corp to Heritage. Is there no switching cost so you can just switch uh, whatever when you want? Kyle, last question. And just one dovetailing off Anthony, which is right now existing home sales, so the turnover homes is extremely bad, as bad as the financial crisis. How much is that? impact in the business such that, because I think at one point the company was earning over $20 a share, and so now it might be 12 Like, how do you think about it? If that metric picks up, or is this trough, so to speak? Yeah, um, so there are obviously some correlation of like house transaction, because most people just, when they bought a new house, well, they will also like remodel and maybe build a pool. But still, back into our previous point, that's if you're not building a pool, in 2020, maybe you are not wanting to build a pool. And also, like, there's a lot of pull forward demand. So maybe the, the house that you are buying have a higher chance of already having a pool. So, and also, we want to mention Forum is uh, actually very critical for the company. Uh, it's tied to 40% of the business. Uh, but the uh, management just misguided last year. And uh, we're not saying. Uh, it's not a conflict. We're just saying management is uh, like overly optimistic about this part of the business. Like last year, management punched the table and told investors there is not going to be over 20% of drop in uh, new pool construction, but the real number is 25 to 30%. So this year, they're guiding again lower than uh, more optimistic than all the other competitors. So, like, this is what, what we see. And also, uh, with the channel check to uh, check the pre-order and the um, uh, backlog of all the com construction companies. And they're talking about like over 20% of uh, decline in new pool construction. So uh, this, is what, this is what we heard. And we actually being conservative and factoring 15% of drop in our estimation. So um, yeah, this is how we approach it. We're not going to say it's not going to take up. We're just going to say this year what we see um, supports our estimation, which is lower than companies guiding. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time! The main event, fighting out of Columbia Business School's corner. My name is John, here with my teammates, Bhakti and Jill, and we are here to tell you why TKO is a knockout long. Tonight, we'll take you through the company and our three investment thesis points. One, the upcoming UFC renewal deal. Two, sponsorship growth. And three, international market penetration. We are valuing this company through the end of 2026 with a price target of $177, implying a 25% IRR from where the stock trades today. We are assuming no multiple expansion. TKO is the parent company of the UFC and the WWE, two global premier assets that offer weekly programming and no off-seasons. While traditional linear television viewership has been on the decline, the WWE, and particularly the UFC, have both been increasing. TKO makes their revenue split, split roughly 50-50 between the UFC and the WWE, 
And 67% of their revenue comes from media, 16% from live events, and 10% from sponsorship. Why is the market giving us this opportunity? As I mentioned before, the merger happened last year in September at $102 a share. Shortly after, the stock traded downwards after the SmackDown deal went below consensus, but more importantly, the Raw deal was not announced at the time. The Bears are saying that we are at peak sports media rights, that <coughs> UFC is a nice-to-have, not a must-to-have sports asset, and that WWE ratings are on the decline. Moving to our first investment thesis point, the UFC media right renewal will go at a 2.2 times step up versus consensus at 1.85 times. Today, both the linear and pay-per-view rights of the UFC sits with the ESPN since they bought the rights in 2018 at a 2.5 times step up and the deal runs through the end of 2025. There is a definitive catalyst to the stock starting in nine months when the exclusive negotiation window between the ESPN and the UFC begins. The ESPN Plus subscription is required in order to buy a UFC pay-per-view fight. This alone has been instrumental to ESPN. UFC pay-per-view buys have been increasing by 9% over the past six years, despite their most popular and profitable athlete, Conor McGregor, not fighting over the past two years. And the current sports media deal environment is favorable for the UFC to get their 2.2 times step up. We spoke with 25 primary research contacts, and we believe the most likely scenario is ESPN retains the rights, given how crucial the UFC is to their ESPN Plus platform per an associate producer at ESPN. We also spoke with a strategist at Amazon who indicated to us that they have a very strong interest in a global popular asset like the UFC that fits well into their portfolio. They already have one of their small competitors won championship as well as a pay-per-view feature for the boxing program they have. ESPN and Amazon are going to fight aggressively over this asset. There's also strong interest from other players as well, like Fox Sports, Netflix, Warner Bros. Discovery, Peacock, and Apple TV. Today, ESPN earns around a 57% margin on the UFC, and that is primarily due to the unique pay-per-view co component of the UFC, in addition that UFC is in control of their production and the costs that come along with it. Just from the pay-per-view revenue alone, ESPN covers the costs that they pay for the UFC, and the digital and linear revenue is all additional on top of that. In order to field an appropriate bid to fend off Amazon, we believe that ESPN will bid a 2.2 times step up, and this would earn them a 30% margin, which is in line with their other sports assets. Right now, all the eyes are on the upcoming NBA media rights deal that is expected to close later this, this year. Consensus has the NBA rights going for a two times step up, and just this morning, there was a surprise announcement that Comcast was going to bid a 2.1 times step up and take Warner Bros. NBA package from that. Once the NBA deal is done, the UFC will be the most sought-after sports asset in the pipeline through the end till 2033. This is the last chance for streamers and linear TV players to build their viewership and add inventory scale in this changing media landscape. I'll now turn it over to Bhakti to talk about sponsorship. Thank you, John. Our second thesis on WWE sponsorship. We're estimating a 20% KGO versus consensus at 10% KGO. As you can see on the left-hand side, on both absolute and per viewer basis, WWE sponsorship is much lower versus its peers. And the reason for that is, the prior CEO of WWE, Vince McMahon, did not want sponsorship to come between the product. As you can see in the pictures, WWE ring has no logos versus UFC ring has nine plus logos. We also spoke to an ex-director of WWE and he mentioned that company had done some, done some research in 2019 which showed that company was losing $100 million of increment revenue because of these restrictions. On the other hand, UFC has been delivering a 22% kegger in sponsorship revenue under Grant Jones' leadership. He will lead now both UFC and WWE and can replicate the same playbook. We're estimating a $75 million of incremental sponsorship revenue, much lower than the $100 million that the company's research had showed back in 2019. I'll hand over to Jill to cover the third thesis on international business. Thank you, Bhakti. Our third thesis is that UFC's international business is highly under-monetized, and the market is underappreciating key inflection points that will drive valuation beyond current consensus. Over 90% of UFC's fans are based outside of the U.S., yet only 23% of revenues are generated internationally. Based on our primary research, we've gained strong conviction that this gap is about to be reduced. And this for three main reasons. Number one, UFC's international fighters 
popularity in their home country has gained all-time highs. And engagement rates on social media platforms have surpassed some of the, even some of the most famous NBA players. Secondly, on the back of this increased popularity of UFC fighters in their home country, local advertisers are showing even more interest. We've seen the last events that happened in Paris and Abu Dhabi that marquee brands, which historically were not associated with the UFC, had shown interest to be associated with the brand. Lastly, management has reiterated several times that they want to do more international events. Consensus does not take that into account. We do. Based on, our, based on conversation with over 10 industry experts, we've gained strong conviction that international monetization will generate $45 million beyond um, current um, market estimates. And this for two main reasons. One, more site fees. Site fees are payments that the UFC receives for organizing an event outside of the US. It can be Abu Dhabi, it can be um, Riyadh, for instance. And those only represent 3% of UFC's revenues today versus 10% for WWE. We think there's room for that number to move from three to five within the next two to three years. Secondly, by selling UFC's international media right as a bundle, as opposed to a piece by piece deal, as is the case today, the business can unlock more value out, out of those uh, rights. We've seen earlier this year that uh, Netflix acquired WWE's international right as part of a bundle, and they set a precedent that has never happened in industry. From speaking to several uh, experts, Amazon, Eurosport, and ESPN are potential buyers of such a bundle deal. On valuations, the median of sports media company, sports companies is at 27 times on NTA Mevi by Bidda basis. The closest peer of TKO is Liberty Formula One, which trades at 20 times EV by Bidda. TKO is trading at 15 times, and we are using the same multiple for our December 2027 EBITDA and arriving at our target price of $177. <coughs> Using various scenarios in our base case, in our, uh, of our thesis, we're arriving at an upside and downside. A downside is minus 10% and upside is 45%. We're estimating an 18.7% EBITDA CAGR in our base case scenario. And to just give a perspective, for UFC, this number was 24% over the last five years. And for WWE, that was 17%. Both these assets had traded historically at 15 times. The punchline is that TKO is a high quality business with a very unique IP and pay per view model. We really like, and, and the business has a very compelling financial profile. For example, incremental EBITDA margin on any revenues gained from step ups at UFC, right, make up 100%. So just let that sink in. They make 100% on any incremental revenues they make on, on TV, right? And we have no reason to think that it would be different because in 2018, when they went to renewal, we, we saw that play out the same way. We've considered several risks to our thesis, and we are more than happy to address those during our Q&A. And that's a knockout. We'll move to the post-match Q&A. <laughs> big component of the thesis is what the step up's going to be on the, I guess that locks in the revenues for the next, I guess, five years. Um, this is unusual as a media property because I think there's some controversy around it versus basketball. Uh, is, is there any, you know, brand uh, risk, you know, um, to uh, some of the other, it would make some of the other bidders less willing to pay a full price that would enable you to get to your uh, you know, valuation. I mean, does Amazon want to associate its brand, for example, with with a fight network? On the first question, Monty can show you that even if it goes for the consensus um, uh, step up, that you can still make money on this stock. But in terms of the brand reputation, um, boxing has been one of the most popular sports probably since before anyone in this room was even born. And many fighters when, uh, that are fighting today wanted to become boxers, and they had no idea what the MMA or UFC is. And the sport has been completely legitimized. In 2001, this started out as a way to promote beer ads. Today, it's now earning $1.3 billion in revenue. It already signed a deal with ESPN that's owned by Disney. And then in addition, we've spoken with three separate um, contacts at Amazon who have not just expressed that they're comfortable with this asset, but they almost are salivating over the potential that this can unlock for their global um, viewership. 
they already own uh, one of their much smaller competitors, one championship, and why risk your reputation brand on a small fish and not the big fish yet? Um, and then going to the younger audience, I would say one of the big proponents of why the UFC is becoming much more popularized, especially among the younger audience, um, Mark Zuckerberg is personality is almost becoming around the MMA now. He's a huge, he promotes the sport. Um, and I think, you know, as someone who's potentially the face of the millennials, as you can see on the left-hand chart, the NFL, NBA wish that they almost had this younger demographic. You look at part of the reasons MLB is, you know, kind of waning away. Sorry if anyone is a baseball fan, but just the core demographics of the UFC is really popular amongst Gen Z and uh, millennials and, um, the structure of the sport, five minutes, rounds, exciting, constant, being knocked out any sign, looks great on TikTok. Um, Grant Swamp is that Great presentation. I actually like watching UFC, so uh, I... <laughs> <laughs> but I guess big picture on the TV renewals, if you think about the likely... Uh, bidders here. A lot of the cable networks have been suffering a lot over the recent years mm -hmm. because linear TV, as you mentioned, is in secular decline. Um, a lot of them, or I guess all of them, have propped up streaming networks, but all the streaming networks, I guess, except for Netflix, are losing money. So I guess what gives you confidence, maybe not for this renewal, but just overall that cable networks will continue shelling out, you know, two times plus multiples for, for sports renewals, given that they're just running out of cash? Yeah. So the strategy over here is to bid for assets that are worth the money. For example, over here you can see, in, let's take ESPN's case, they cut down NASCAR because NASCAR's worship was declining. On the other hand, they have given soft bids to MLB in the past and they are indicating the same. Uh, there's an expert in this space called John Orand, who is a, a media expert, and he mentioned that UFC is one of the prime assets, as uh, John explained in terms of pay-per-view buys and all of that, for ESPN. And that's an ESPN is so crucial that they would want to bid on that, and they would want to cut out cut out on MLB, which would not make so much money, or cut down on things that don't are not the worth. <laughs> and overall, what you mentioned about streamers, for streamers, pay per view buys are just an important co component. So we understand what you're saying that Amazon is Amazon, Netflix, and Netflix are losing money. But these assets, are because of pay-per-view buys, will make so much margins that even, like 13% margin is our math, and we discuss this with many media experts, and that is much higher than the 4% margins that they're making in the overall business. Can you talk a, bit, a little bit more about um, the marketing and the cost uh, base uh, here? Um, I assume that there's um, a big marketing cost component. Um, and what is the trajectory of that? And do you think that the free cash, cash flow conversion can increase? Um, any details there? Yeah, so SGNA cost is almost 12% of sales. So that's one. But if you look at the historical KGOS, uh, this has been an important component of growth. And we are building the same growth levels going ahead. But the other point is that of uh, what uh, Jill was mentioning that the media rights bring a lot of mo incremental money to the margins. That's an important point to highlight. Uh, one sec. In addition, also to add from a marketing standpoint, like the current rights today are with ESPN. They're in charge of promotion. UFC is in charge of selling the tickets. So because of this incremental margins, and we saw this in the past also when uh, UFC was uh, up for renewal, that you see this whole incremental margins coming in. So the other cost, even if you grow at a higher scale, free cash from our flow is very high. Um, can you talk a little bit, bit about pricing power? So I have a, a Gen Z twins boys, and I don't know how many $99 fees have shown up on my credit card. <laughs> so um, what is the pricing power? And then touch again a little bit about Gen Z's fascination mm -hmm. with this sport. So we'll address the uh, second part of the question first. The, what they've got right is the way they've transferred the, tra the um, content into TikTok, which is the platform that Gen Z is the, the most. The short version of um, the videos have had extremely high success. And we know, although it is a problem on the personal level, but we know that attention span is, is an issue. And they've been able to 
show what the main event, what the biggest actions that happen in, in a short period of time. So that's, that's number one. On your first question on um, pricing power, we have a chart that shows that they've been able to increase pay-per-view significantly, uh, like four times in a row from 50 plus to 70 just today, but yet the number of pay-per-views Kegar over that period of time has been 9%. Um, 9%. So they have a very strong, um, they have a very strong pricing power. Uh, we think that that's also one reason why it's a very, uh, it's a very compelling, uh, compelling business. And on top of that, you have to subscribe to ESPN Plus to be able to pay the pay per view, which adds another component of attracting new subscribers to their, um, to their platform. And to show you why Gen Z loves the UFC, we'll show you a photo of the current roster of some of the. <laughs> Of the UFC <laughs> fighters, I imagine most people in this room know who Conor McGregor are, but there are a lot of other stars, especially if you're a UFC fan, to highlight the Gen Z, Sugar Sean Malley, on the bottom left, between his hair and, and TikTok content. He might be the first fighter that didn't even have to win fights and become popular yet. It used to be, if you won your matches, that's, you know, ESPN would push you out. He just looks like... Uh, like a fun guy and you know <laughs> that gets views on TikToks that translates into fans and viewerships. Um, so the future of UFC and the fighters is in good hands. I had a question on the WWE side of things. Um, obviously uh, Vince McMahon uh, sold his entire stake in TKO which is I, I found kind of shocking uh, because he paid capital gains taxes on it and presumably and everything. So uh, that's an interesting move. Um, there's speculation that he's I don't believe he has a non-compete, and there's speculation that he's out for blood subsequent to how he was treated, uh, specifically that he might buy something like All Elite Wrestling and turn it into a competitor. You know, he obviously has a ton of relationships in the industry with top stars. Um, what's the risk uh, competitively there? Absolutely great, great question. And um, R. Emanuel basically booted him from the company as soon as there was some disturbing civil lawsuits filed against him. and. As you mentioned, he was um, a 15% shareholder, and as of last Friday, he announced he's remaining the last share. So we view it as a positive for him to be away from the company and every other uh, executive's buying except him, so we don't think he doesn't believe in the asset. Why he won't start a, his own competitor, two reasons. He has a lot of legal issues that he needs to deal with, and I imagine part of the reason he's selling his shares is to fund that. Two, quite honestly, he's 78 years old, I don't, his whole legacy is the WWE that him and his wife started in 1979. I think if he tried taking the AEW and pouring all of his assets into it, and it's, the AEW is already extremely unprofitable, there's questions around if it's even going to stick around. I don't think that's how he wants to be remembered, let alone the legal issues and his age that comes into question. And people we've spoken to in the industry have all suggested that he's going to try to maybe kick his feet up and avoid these legal issues and live on with his life. You know, like this, the business has very high operating margins. Part of that, I think, is the fact that the stars are relatively cheap here compared to other sports. Mm -hmm. um, but as the stars develop, obviously, more popularity and a presence, build their own brands, what, what's the risk that the, the cost of goods here has been uh, underpriced uh, <coughs> and that the stars are going to get better representation and uh, extract higher you know, baseball, basketball, like, uh, you know, yeah. what, what, can the margins sustain themselves? Yeah, great question. So here, what has happened is uh, three things. First of all, UFC lawsuit was settled at much lower price uh, than the street was expecting. And the other thing is, we spoke to an ex, uh, ex UFC fighter, and he mentioned that an average fighter at UFC fights only twice in a year, or and max two times in his career. So the power that they have is very low, and they can pay much more money to the high-end stars. And this is different from other leagues, where you keep seeing players much more amount of time in a year. The other point is also that UFC enjoys a huge scale advantage. It's the one who is going to be able to pay the top notch. It's a $1.3 billion revenue company. The top, the next two players, one championship has $100 million of revenue, and the third player, uh, PLF, has $50 million of revenue. So that scale advantage is also against them. And plus people, uh, the fight, sorry, the fighters want to win and play, for, uh, win and fight for UFC. That brand 
also helps them to get cheaper athletes to start with. Yeah, and one more, just to complement what you said, most fighters are independent contractors, and there is no line in sight that the structure of, um, of compensation or, or the relationship with the UFC will turn into a percentage of, of revenue. So the costs are really um, based on their individual contract, and like you said earlier, we don't see pressure or any risk of them going to competition. And even when some of the fighters go, the impact has been actually very, very limited. Um, how do you think about the risks of investing in a controlled company? So Endeavor owns, I think, more than the majority of uh, the voting stock here. Um, do you see a risk to, like Paramount is in the news recently, because they have Class A and Class B stock, the Class A shareholders, you know, the Redstone family seems like they're going to take a deal that's better for themselves and not for the Class B shareholders, right? Um, so I guess, what are you, what are the risks, I guess, to, to investing in a company like this? Sure. Um we're not going to beat around the bush here. The reality is it is a control entity. And yes, now that um, Civil Lake 2 took Endeavor private, do you run the risk that can they, you know, lever up the, the entity? Can they do something that will go at the expense of current minority shareholders? The answer is yes. Now, that being said, the way we got comfortable around the risk, uh, there are different ways we got comfortable around it. Number one, we actually spoke to an M&A slash corporate lawyer about this, this structure. And it became apparent that the Delaware courts since 2015, with the Corvin and uh, versus KKR case, they increasingly uh, they increase the security scrutiny around transactions that are led by control investors. We had the same case happening um, with Mai Tai right now with Carly. They in a you know, fight around that. So number one, the, the the regulatory and the legal backdrop for this is very aware of this. Number two. We got comfort that Endeavor is an, is an office structure. So um, with the deal that Silver Lake did, we feel that they've been more friendly, quote unquote, to minority investors. They offered 55% premium on taking um, uh, investors at the uh, at, at Endeavor Private, and we feel comfortable that it's not in their interest to misbehave, quote unquote. And one more reason is. Let's say in worst case, right? Let, let's say downside cases, at some point, Silver Lake becomes very smart about this. Stock keeps going down and they want to buy the company at a lower price. We think first that the, the, the stock will, will drop, but in that case, you at least guarantee a form of premium, because as we see, they paid 55% premium on, at, at Endeavor. We don't know how much they will pay here, but we think that the premium you would definitely get as a shareholder if they go through that, through that side gives you some uh, downside protection going forward. And one more point on Paramount, the great example. Um, class B shares of Paramount had zero votes versus their uh, versus Class A shares. Over here, your economic interest, economic rights and voting rights are aligned. You have one economic right, you have one voting share. So that also is a, a base. Okay, thanks so much. Thank Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we're pitching Valvoline as a long with a 2027 price target around 84 bucks to share. This implies 95% price upside, 22% IRR, and the risk reward skews favor favorably here at just over three times. So what is Valvoline? Valvoline is an owner, operator, and franchisor of vehicle service centers, primarily based in the US and Canada. They primarily focus on quick loop and light maintenance and repair services. So following the sale of their global products business in March of 2023 to Aramco, Valvoline is now a pure play unit growth and comp growth type of store today. So around half of the store base is franchise and the remainder are company owned. And Valvoline today is not the same business it was for many years. Previously, it was a subsidiary of Ashland. And to say it didn't receive the attention it deserved would be an understatement. You can see managers' <laughs> recognition of this issue when they spun it out in 2017. However, products still continued to divert management's attention until they ultimately divested that business in 2023. 
Today, investors have the opportunity to buy into a business that is performing extremely well and has only recently begun to benefit from the effects of a hyper-focused management team. So how will you make money in this stock? First, as a pure play, management will have the capital and focus to capture the white space and ride the secular tailwind of this industry. Secondly, we believe that EV sentiment is overstated and the terminal value underappreciated. And then lastly, high returns on capital will drive significant cash flow generation and share cannibalization. All in all, we believe these three dynamics will drive low 20s IRRs for investors over the next three years. And with around 1,800 units today, we believe management can meet their goal of 3,500 plus. The addressable market is large and highly fragmented, and our research points to significant white space opportunity for new units. We wrote our own code to scrape location data across quick loop majors, and we analyzed the intersection of that data against state vehicle registrations. Leveraging that research and assuming current peak market density, we sized our lower bound. On the other end, if we assume that quick lubes dominate the do it for me or defim oil change market, we then, we then size our upper bound. Both estimates far exceed the number of units today. Valvoline also benefits from attractive unit <laughs> economics, a strong value proposition for both corporate and franchisee new unit development. Over the past few years, a highly inflationary environment, Valvoline was still able to kager profitability at a faster rate than sales. In addition, based on discussions with franchisees, we estimate a 20% unlevered IRR and a 45% levered IRR over a four, four, five year forecast period for a single VIOC. Pretty impressive. Babeline also has the building blocks of a competitive advantage that will allow them to capitalize on the white space to opportunity ahead. First, Babeline is singularly focused while its competitors are distracted. Second, Babeline has been investing heavily in its teams and technologies to drive operational excellence that is reflected in the results. Their unit performance vastly outperforms their peers. Lastly, Valvoline has a, a number of large, highly capitalized franchisee partners, as well as a bunch of smaller franchisee partners that operate at scale to drive unit growth, a combination or franchisee dynamic that none of their peers can boast. So turning back to the top line, Valvoline has consistently posted high single digit to low double digit same source sales growth, even when accounting for in, in normalizing for the D cell during the pandemic. We believe that these core ticket and traffic drivers are still intact and that this algorithm is sustainable going forward. This isn't just an inflation pricing story. So turning, uh, we're, we're going to traffic. The key secular trend that you need to care about here is the shift from DIY to do it for me or DFIN. The DIY divide tends to be drawn on income lines. Simply put, people with higher household incomes are more likely to outsource their basic car needs. Based on demographic and in, 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 in survey work, we believe that do it for me is poised to capture, to continue capturing share from DIY, but there's a lot of runway to do so, considering that DIY still has around 40% of the overall oil change market. As millennials and Gen Z enter their higher earning years, we're more confident that, that this is sustainable, positive traffic growth for valvoline boxes. Now going to ticket and mix, the first driver here is around non-oil change services and fleet services. These are small but rapidly growing parts of the overall sales mix that are highly accretive to overall ticket. The fleet business in particular is a focus of the new CEO. Serving these customers comes with 20% higher tickets on average and allows for more usage of a single Babylon box. While still early innings, even really simple initiatives, like just building out a CRM system to track and, and, and capture this highly fragmented market, are already yielding positive results to date as evidenced by the new account ads and the contribution to top line growth. The other ticket and niche driver is around the premiumization. More vehicles in the car park require higher priced synthetic oil. There is a debate around whether or not this pricing benefit is offset by the theoretically longer oil change interval times, but at this point, oil change frequency is thoroughly embedded you know, in customer behavior, and our primary research is nearly unanimously supported by this year. You know, again, you know, major, you know, people are more likely to pay more for light maintenance costs you know, for their more increasing vehicles, and better oil does degrade over time. So while we expect unit growth to drive the majority of our system sales growth going forward, um, we still expect these key traffic and ticket drivers to support, again, that high single-digit comp growth algorithm. So we've talked about all the great things ahead, but when it comes to ICE-focused businesses, people want to know how long the show can go on. The EV penetration debate has a wide array of ever-changing opinions. We really focus on trying to bound our assumptions. While the EIA forecast of 12% market share by 2050 may be reasonable, we decided to evaluate this risk through Toyota's more punitive lens of 30%. 
This market share still implies a 2050 ICE car park, only 5% below today's level, which represents considerable white space given the current footprint of quick loop uh, locations. Additionally, it's not a straight line to this point. In our analysis, given increasing EV sales and normal scrap rates, the ICE car park may not fall below today's level until the late 2030s. Not to mention the fact we have further support from the continued proliferation of hybrids, which act as a bridge during this period, uh, period of transition, and come with the same oil change service needs as their fully ICE counterparts. Additionally, we believe that the EV euphoria is starting to rationalize. As the initial cohort of EV buyers matures, consumers are realizing what the full cost of EV ownership entails outside of just fuel cost savings. The, the high price tag and short useful life of EV batteries has a direct impact on the residual values of these vehicles. This is driving higher financing and higher insurance costs as well as lower than expected resale values. So the EV transition story has some real economic hurdles to clear. But Valvoline isn't waiting to be the last horse and buggy in town. Management recognizes that even an EV world will require some form of quick service solution, representing an opportunity for the company to leverage <coughs> it as its true asset. It's a network of conveni conveniently located service bays and technicians, which we believe over the next few years will likely be the largest and densest in the country. So management is already piloting maintenance programs geared and advertised directly to the EV market. <coughs> and lastly, our final thesis point is focused on continued disciplined capital allocation. Babylon's unit economics drive significant cash flow generation, which in the hands of honest, man honest management can create phenomenal returns for investors. This is a management team that has proven that they do not waste cash and have continued to reiterate their plan of returning capital to shareholders through buybacks. Using both their operational cash flows and its balance sheet, we expect Valvoline to buy back approximately 20% of the outstanding shares through 2027, all while funding their extensive growth plans. And Valvoline's commitment to returning cash to shareholders, its robust economics position it to become another industry cannibal like AutoZone and O'Reilly, who have been able to substantially grow net income while strategically repurchasing shares to fuel share price appreciation. The precedent they set raises our level of confidence that Valvoline will be able to do the same. Moreover, management's compensation structure with their shift back to EPS-based incentives going forward further align with these shareholder supportive actions. So tying all of this back into valuation and our $84 price target in 2027, the base case algorithm that gets you there from a 24 to 27 on a Kager basis is roughly 10% store growth, 8% comp growth, 16% top, uh, top line growth, around 27% EBITDA margins with high 20s incrementals, so we're not underwriting a lot of margin expansion here, and 25% EPS growth on 70% free cash flow conversion. We're head of the street on all metrics near the high end of management's long-term stated algorithm. And we arrived at our price target using a 21 times forward PE multiple on our fiscal 28 EPS estimate. And this translates to around 14 times EV to EBITDA based on our capital structure assumptions. As we mentioned earlier, we do believe that the risk reward skews attractively here just over three times on our base case assumptions and assuming nearly 30% price downside in our business. And though we didn't consider this in our scenarios, this business offers significant optionality for a proactive investor to take advantage of to increase returns. Not only could Valvoline refranchise its corporate-owned stores, they could also relever. Valvoline's current conservative balance sheet and its history of same-store sales growth and solid free cash flow conversion mean that two turns of incremental leverage could potentially yield $1.4 billion in incremental value. We identified a few key risks that we covered during the presentation and happy to go into more detail in Q&A, but that concludes the presentation. Thank you for listening. What has management said about uh, how do they decide which store should be franchised versus owned? You know, do they, have they looked at a refranchising strategy? Have you looked at that adjusted for you know tax, et cetera? Does that make sense? Yeah, so they haven't like discussed it outright. Um, the plan or the history has all been like very much focused on corporate owned stores. But going forward, the big push, like the 2027 long term goal, has all been about shifting the mix more towards franchising, taking off a little bit of that burden from the company and putting on the franchise partners. So going forward, that's the goal we haven't actually looked at. They haven't said anything about re-franchising. So just basic numbers, what's the enterprise value of the company today is? Uh, it's five billion plus the billion of debt, billion of debt. Billion. And the, the, what are their stores, like when their stores transact and the store is sold? So, yeah, so we got to the 4.5 billion using basically what a 2027 EBITDA would look like, 450,000. A single store, if you're just selling at a one-off, small operator goes like the five to seven range. We actually have a private market number for 150, net, 150 store network that went about 14 times. 
Um, so we did an evaluation at like eight times the company-owned stores EBITDA times the 1,264 stores they'd be in 2027. And no one's asked the question on a conference call why they haven't refranchised stores or they've never responded to it? Um, we, we did some rough math of trying to figure out what that would look like. And given the 4% take rate, I, we just don't know what the cost structure looks like on a fully franchised system. So it can get to the top line revenue number, but like they've been running these operations for so long and they've have like, they'll, they have uh, like almost a thousand company owned stores now. Like what does SGNA look like? And you don't own this anymore. And so you really can't, I can't back into it. And so we just wanted to highlight what the value of just their assets will be at that point in time. Regardless, the company owned store economics are so, so strong. And we're not at this point yet where we necessarily need to unlock this value. Like there are multiple ways to win in the stock. Those are just free call options essentially. And what are the unit economics to the franchisee? To so the franchisee? Do you want to talk through that? Yeah. This is for the company owned, but you can overlay the franchisee. Oh, yeah. In terms of, I mean, this is all on a levered basis here, but as we can see, I want to get this number right. You know, it's roughly, you know, two and a half times, you know, MOIC, you know, on that year five, assuming that four times exit multiple and kind of a low 20s IRR. And, you know, again, I think the IRRs and the returns are even better whenever you factor in leveraging it. You know, it's pretty cheap to build one of these boxes. 1.8 million to 2 million was kind of what we heard at the very high end. Um, but if you lever that up and you do like a sim lease back transaction, you know, the IRRs are even better. But this is for an unlevered store box. And, and this is all based on kind of uh, on FDD filings and kind of seeing how these progress over time. And compared to peers, unit economics are, are superior to other quick move peers. And the, the franchisees do a combination of own the real estate or lease it. Some of them are like smaller mom and pop investors, like they own five or six, and they like having that hard asset, which is the real estate. But when you do a sale lease spec transaction for these, which there's a lot of triple nets out there, you just search Babbling triple net lease, they're, they're all over the place. Um, you really juice the IRR and you can get up to like 40, 45% IRRs, assuming like a, an exit in five years. Do you have any sense of whether this, uh, the franchisees versus company-owned stores, and a lot of companies, um, the franchisees are massively more profitable and productive? Um, do you, were you able to tease yeah. that out? And how, how big is the delta here, and how might it compare yeah, to other it's, companies? It's really not that big of a delta if you're looking at it purely on a compo perspective. I, it, you know, it ebbs and flows, but it's not more than, I don't think, 100 to the basis points, which, again, it is not, but it, you know, is that good or bad news for the stock? Because I would almost want to see a bigger delta because that tells me the company-owned stores have, there's probably a lot of low-hanging fruit to improve yeah. their performance. There, and again, like keep in mind that the company-owned stores too, like there's more experimentation going on. You know, there's that element. But still, like we're still talking about, you know, a high single-digit comp growth type of story for both the company-owned and the franchise store. It's not like the company's only comping 2% and the franchisees are... 8%. Like, we're still in that mid to high single digit bucket. And it's on important. the expense side, similar, you don't, you, you have no reason to believe there's a big difference because often the franchisees are just yeah. leaner operators. Yeah, we talked to one franchisee in the Northeast where they own like 100 of these things, and they say they do a little bit better on the expense side. The one example he gave, though, was putting back, push, pushing back on litigation items. So, like, corporate will just pay out for, like, you know, the small claims. They're like, no, we're not, we're going to take you to court. Um, that was his one point, but I don't pretty much similar overall because when you hear like management will say mature box says around like 500 to 550 EBITDA and when you look at the um, the median and average from the FDDs it's just a little bit less and the difference really being the, uh, the fees another great presentation thank you so um, you flew over this data point where you talked about scraping location data and matching it with license information. Could you talk about the methodology? Did you use AI? And ex could you just go over that once more? Or AI. Yeah, I should <laughs> talk a little bit about that. Um, we wrote our own code in, in R to essentially scrape location data from Valvoline's website, um, as well as um, from the other major quick lube players. And when we pulled in that data, we then analyzed essentially the, the store address. We mapped that um, using like an API to, to Google Maps. We mapped their locations across the US. And then we also considered essentially the um, number of uh, vehicles registered in each state, uh, as well as the population um, density with a re surrounding each uh, Valvoline or Jiffy Lube or Take 5 
in a 10 mile radius. Um, and we essentially determined that valvoline, and we didn't, we kind of went over this, uh, we didn't mention this point in the presentation, but essentially valvoline has landed in, in so many places where they haven't fully expanded. This slide is a, is a good example of that. So on this, we have a, essentially an example where there's 21 valvolines in a 10 mile radius. And there's 1.1 million people in that 10 mile radius. However, when we go to the lower end or say a less dense area, there's actually only one or two valvolines in a 10 mile radius and 0 0.8 million people in that 10 mile radius. Again, implying that there's significant room to expand where they've already landed. And, and yeah, then you sorry. compare that with Jiffy Lube and Take 5, and it's actually the opposite. Like their distribution of stores is pretty much in line with the population, and so they don't really have much room to fortress around where they already are, and we can fortress more, uh, more densely. It's important to see that, that there's this parabolic line on this chart versus the others, which are downward sloping. So essentially you're saying Valvoline has the opportunity to cluster their stores more so than Jiffy. Yeah. And part of this is because they work so closely with their franchisee partners. They have a model that apparently is, is very good at helping them select locations that are in areas that have great population density. And we even ran some, you know, time series math essentially on what those population dynamics have been over the past few years. And on average, we did a sampling of, say, 500 different locations for each concept. Valvoline, uh, the population growth is about 100 bips greater on average versus other um, versus other concepts. And I think they're able to do this more effectively as well because of just the makeup of their franchisee base. You know, it's, it's smaller, better capitalized, more institutional compared to, you know, Take Five and Grease Monkey and those guys. You know, you have a more concentrated franchisee base. It, it's not the similar to restaurants where if you have a fragmented U.S. franchisee base and then you have a master franchisee in Europe or something, you're able to operate more efficiently, you're better capitalized, it's kind of that. So getting back to the last point, um, is it possible that the reason why they're underpenetrated with Valvolines is that they, they're more competitive marketplaces with their other, I mean, have you, I assume you've looked at the consolidated numbers, right? Yeah. Are, are places where there are few val Valvolines per pop, mm -hmm. um, places where their competitors have higher <coughs> per population? There is some overlap in terms of where, say, Valvolines are um, and the competitors, but I think this chart kind of shows that there really is a difference in site selection between Valvoline versus its, its competitors. Valvoline is the blue bar here, and they're just in areas where there, frankly, is more population density versus their competitors, indicating they do have a way of finding those locations better than the other concepts. There has been a management upgrade there as well. Like the new head of real estate came from Wake Stop. He was at McDonald's before, both known for that. So it's kind of like a management as well as, you know, also the pie is, is pretty large, you know, in the lower bound and the upper bound. So plenty of white space to add these. And DIY still is 40% of the market. So. Um, can you talk a little bit, I mean, the revenue growth is really impressive with the highest single digit same store sales and like mid-teens revenue growth. Uh, I assume the category, like the overall industry of services they provide is growing way slower than that. Um, so what is like the total like addressable market growing at and uh, how much of this is like gaining share from DIY versus gaining share from other DIFM players versus other kind of impacts? Yeah. So for the total market, like what the real driver is, is the, the average number of people that are in the driving age population. And if you look back, the past decade has been about like 1% Hager in historical car park growth at Catan, like what's really addressable. But what's interesting <coughs> about that figure is that over the last decade, the driving age population will increase by 30 bips. And then over the next two decades, we're going to increase by 43 bips. That kind of 15 to what I'm going to call 70 as, as the true drivers. And so like, that's how I see the adjustable market going and the car park growth um, going. So we did 1% on 30 bibs, maybe we can start with a little bit more. But what's more important, though, is we're going to go from a falling 35 to 40, 54 age group to the accelerating one, where you know the past decade was 23 bibs compression every year to 77 bibs expansion. And that older age group is really who's coming here because the funniest thing we learned is that it's like the Gen Zs and the millennials that change their own oil, which made absolutely no sense. Like, I didn't believe it at first. Like that's what the surveys are saying and like the store managers are saying, <coughs> young people. And so as they age up, you know, have more money in their pocket, they go into DFIM and the fact that they're so much bigger than the Gen Xers is going to be really impactful. Can you have like the structural pool or 
tailwind on, on the traffic side. But, you know, and for peers, you know, there are some private peers, but kind of what we heard, kind of comping in that low to mid single digit range. So Valvoline's a lot better. Again, like they are more, how to put it, institutional is the right way to do it, but they have actually, it's, it's called the, the super pro, the super pro system. system. Yeah. Like they actually have a way of operating it, which, you know, again, makes them more efficient as well. But also, you have the fleet services business, you have that structural uplift in the premiumization. The fleet services opportunity, you know, based on somebody that we talked to, another blog in the name said that is pretty underappreciated in, in our numbers compared to theirs. And this is, you know, serving, you know, it's rental car companies kind of in that vein. And, and, and more importantly with that, like you're, you know, it's a higher ticket, but then you're also able to use the box and off-peak hours and, you know, it's just overall, I think there are a lot of building blocks here, both the traffic and the ticket side to support that high single digit comp. And that, and that probably is one of the bigger bear theses on the stock, besides the EV risk. It's just, is management's guidance attainable, or is it too high? You know, a point on the fleet services as well is like why competitors won't go for it. We talked to a big operator of Diffy Lube and asked him, like, do you all do fleet? Is it interesting? He goes, oh, it's awesome. I'd love to go after it, but like, I just, I don't. And we're like, why? It's like, I just don't have the time. And the fact that corporate's kind of taking that on themselves and building up a CRM and going to get those contracts to dish, to dish them out, basically, makes this a lot more compelling story for Fleet than maybe Diffie Lube or those other smaller players that can't handle national accounts. Like if you only have 500 locations, it's a little bit more difficult. You're going to get consistent pricing as well. Like, in the past, they haven't really given back a whole lot of price, you know, whenever input costs go up with oil or something like that. But, again, like we think that high signature comp is reasonable. Uh, great presentation. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, great presentation. Um, I guess what's your confidence in the unit growth um, paper there? It's you know quite high. I know they've done you know nine percent in the past, but I guess mm -hmm. in the era of higher interest rates, a lot of franchise companies have taken down their unit unit growth. I think what's really helpful for this business is the box is so profitable. So when you're selling and competing for these corner spot spots next to Costco and whatnot, like the person who's going to win the bid and get the property is the one that has the most economic benefit from it. And these guys are, you know, the five-year ROIC is like mid mid twenties, high twenty percent. And so they can, they, I think they have the better chance of filling the boxes. On the second point, as far as like the actual growth and the capacity, they went and built out a new development team over the past like year or two that can is designed for a hundred new stores a year just on the company side. Like they, they're planning for this, they're building for this, and so while they haven't done a hundred new stores a year previously, they can do that. There's also we under. We're kind of being conservative on the company-owned side because they can also go and do M and A. Like this new build-out was just for ground up, and they've always they've always done M and A between like thirty and sixty stores a year, kind of for the past couple of years. So on that side, it makes sense. And then the franchisees just can't get enough of this. They they, they they're just continuing to deploy capital. But yeah, yeah and like they have better capitalized franchisees, as we mentioned earlier. Like there's not a risk of you know if all of your store growth was dependent on a guy who owns three or four of them in Pittsburgh, you know it's like it's tougher. But you have more institutionally franchisees with access to capital. And I think just in, in handicapping the overall story, whenever you're, you know, whenever it's a growth driven story, it's like store plus comp, like I feel much better because the store growth is much more in management's control than what the comp is going to be. So I, I think this is more of a durable and, 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 and a less risky uh, story than a lot of other people. And it's funded by cash flow. And then also if they start doing sale lease specs, which they've said in the last last one or the one before earnings call that they're going to look at ways to make the cash outlay smaller. So they have that lever to pull as well to speed up growth if they don't have the cash. Yeah. yeah. And then just a small comment on this. I, you know, my experience is there, there are arguments you can make in favor of having a concentrated franchise base and there are arguments you can make against. Obviously, the, the, the bargaining power of a concentrated franchise base is much greater than one of, with, you know, McDonald's where they own five units on average or whatever the number is. Um, is that a risk uh, in terms of uh, yeah, how do you think about that? Yeah, we view them. You know, uh, Valvoline has viewed their franchise major franchisees as partners that have helped them grow their unit growth, and we haven't seen any risks. Uh, I guess in reading that FDD, um, that they may bargain to incre increase their take rates or reduce or impact. And, and the franchise partners have really good things to say because by working with Valvoline, they have a direct line to the product. Which you, you have through Shell and Jiffy, but the other players, I think you're going to get a little more price volatility on the input. 
and, they're, and the, the cost structure when they spend off the, the product's business is a set dollar margin yes. cost structure, not a percentage basis, which really helps. And I think that it's a, it's very, uh, there's, there's a co-benefit there for both people. And at this stage in the game too, like the unit, not, like the unit economics are still really solid. Like there's, there's still a lot of, you know, we're not fighting over scraps in a lot of ways. There's still a lot of white space out there economically. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much.